Hi, Western Civ. Mr. Pulley here, looking uh, at our new textbook, uh, the electronic version, chapters 13 and 14, but starting off with chapter 13 here and looking at the age of exploration. Uh, we're going to look at some of the new innovations that allow Europeans to begin exploring after that big wait of a thousand years. Uh, we will then also look at some of the explorers, but looking at them by country, uh, starting with the Portuguese, followed by Spain, then the Dutch, and then the English. And then finally, we'll try and reconcile who that guy it is that the Americas are named for, Amerigo Vespucci, and a little more about him and why he's important, or if he should be. Okay, reasons for exploration, the ideas that we often give for Europeans, you know, say they're doing this for God, for glory, and for gold in that order. But if you ask me, it's not necessarily in that order. It seems to be more often that really gold is more the reason. Okay. The continents of the Western Hemisphere uh, are named for a guy by the name of Amerigo Vespucci. And Amerigo Vespucci, we'll talk more about him later on because he's not really the guy a lot of people think that he actually is. Okay, some of those innovations that came about that helped the Europeans explore after that big thousand year hiatus they took uh, inward fighting we sometimes refer to as the Middle Ages or the Dark Ages after the fall of the Roman Empire. Uh, we have the compass. The compass uh, is first developed in China and through trade gets to the Europeans. Uh, there are references to it back in the fourth century BC in China. Um, certainly, at least by the mid AD 1000s, there are uh, compasses uh, in Europe. Uh, and in fact, the Olmecs might have even had one of these things prior to the Chinese before even 1000 BC. So, its exact origins we don't know. The one that gets to the Europeans does come from China. Another innovation that comes to the uh, Europeans is something called the astrolabe, which helps them find direction. It dates back to the Hellenistic world. That's that time period after the Greeks, uh, that spread of Greek civilization by Alexander the Great, you may recall. Okay, uh, these are developed by Islamic scholars, the ones you see here. Uh, these are used in navigational aids to help find your position. Uh, they are brought back to Europe by Crusaders during the time period of the Crusades. Uh, again, these help uh, plot their location primarily in terms of latitude north and south of the equator and with pretty good accuracy. This will later be uh, sh shrunk down by the English. This is in 1388. They're using now a quadrant. If I go back here quickly, you'll see this uses an entire circle. They're using a quadrant or one quarter of a circle. Uh, sailors then will develop that down to make it even smaller by using a sextant one-sixth of a circle. And sextants, by the way, are still used today even on nuclear-powered aircraft carriers in the United States Navy. Hey, if all those uh, GPS global positioning satellites go down, they still got to be able to figure out where they're at. They teach them how to do it by hand, just in case. Another thing that comes about is the Caravelle. This is the new type of ship that uh, is developed, and there are some uh, new innovations, uh, one of which is the Lantine or triangular sail, uh, which is another thing we get from the Muslim world during the Crusades. And as you can see here, this is uh, one on the Nile River in Egypt still being used today. Okay, I'll think about these Caravelles that we need to know. Okay, it's a fast uh, ship than the older ships used to be. It's a low draft, which means it sits very shallow in the water, which means it can be go up river actually in sort of very shallow rivers because it doesn't have a very uh, much of the ship below the water level. Okay, as again that lanteen sail, which is an important thing. It has a rear mounted rudder, which improves its uh, ability to turn and tack and go into the wind, which makes it able to sail into the wind. That ability of sailing sort of across the wind to be able to sail into the wind. Uh, it's later replaced by a ship called the Carrick. Uh, this is a uh, drawing of the Santa Maria, which was Columbus's flagship. Now, another innovation here is the printing press. Mr. Pulley, what does the printing press have to do with selling technology? Well, new ideas and maps are developed, and how did that information spread with the printing press? Now, again, this is modeled after the olive and grape presses, and uh, Johannes Gutenberg in Germany is a guy who in, is credited with developing the movable type printing press uh, that helps spread information very quickly and makes the price of books drop rapidly. Uh, Gutenberg again, the uh, movable type printing press here. Movable types is used 
uh, books very fast produced. This lowers our cost because the cost less, demand goes up. But the big issue here is new ideas spread faster. Just ask Martin Luther how fast things change. What they do is you pick out the individual letters, put them in the plate here, lock them in place, and then print your page. It's not very quick for to set it up, but once you got it set up, I can make as many pages as I want. Now, our first explorers uh, of the Europeans are the Portuguese, and the Portuguese are aided by this guy right here, Prince Henry the Navigator. Now, the Navigator actually never goes out sailing per se with any of his explorations. He's like the patron uh, in a Renaissance time period who helps the artist, you know, have the ability to make the paintings and gives them supplies and things like that. And Prince Henry founds a na navigational school uh, on the coast to help do that. And he often spends a lot of his time out at that school, you know, seeing what's going on. His explorers discover islands off the uh, coast of Africa uh, looking for gold. And uh, they bring in slaves from the West Coast and get all the way down to what was later called the Gold Coast and Ivory Coast. Uh, this knowledge of those early explorers passes to later Portuguese explorers. Uh, Diaz and da Gama. So let's talk a little bit more about these guys. Bartholomew Diaz, uh, he's a guy who gets around uh, Western Africa and gets all the way around the tip uh, of Southern Africa, uh, now called the Cape of Good Hope. Okay, He made several voyages along the uh, east coast of Africa, discovers that Cape of Good Hope in 1488. Uh, and this allows Europeans to reach the Far East and bypass the Islamic middlemen in the trade that used to have to come through here through the Mediterranean. And it's also bypassing, by the way, the Italian city-states that thrive on that trade. Then there's Vasco da Gama. Uh, Vasco da Gama here is, uh, follows his father's lead as a sailor. His father also uh, did those exploration voyages along the west coast of Africa. Uh, his father is given the goal of reaching the, uh, India by sea, uh, and Vasco has to defend forts off, uh, uh, off Africa and gets the job uh, to do so, to sail to India. Uh, there were forts that uh, had been taken over, and he takes those back, uh, and some other forts by other places. Defeating them gives him the right to go on that journey. He becomes the first European to do so, and again, maps, as I said, are kept a secret. We're not going to give you guys the keys, so to speak, to our trade secrets here, but it won't last for long. Okay, the Spanish are going to be our next explorers, right next to the Kingdom of Portugal. We have uh, the kingdoms here of uh, Spain. Uh, these are the second great explorers after the Portuguese, uh, and they will go on to become the world's first superpower. Okay, here's the guy most famously associated with sailing and Spain. In 1492, Spanish finished the reconquest of Spain from the Moors, who were Muslims. That's uh, Ferdinand and Isabella, who combined their kingdoms of Castile and Aragon in order to do that and put up a unified front against them, and so that's what they do. Okay, They fund Christopher Columbus, and even though their advisors say it's a bad idea, his uh, idea has no merit, they fund it anyway. It's not going to cost them that much, less than a state big party for a visiting dignitary. Okay. He thinks the distance to Asia is less than it actually is. In fact, he thinks about only half the size it is because he's been consulting the wrong maps and the wrong books because he's self-educated. Okay, he discovers a new world but thinks he's landed in Asia, and that's how Native Americans become called Indians because he thinks he's off the coast of India. Yikes. Okay, the Spanish uh, in the New World here will take over very quickly. Uh, they'll find gold and silver in the New World and bring that gold and silver back. And in doing so, unfortunately, cause havoc in their economy with inflation caused by the falling price of gold and silver now. Uh, they figure out that it isn't Asia, and the Catholic Church backs them because they have strong ties to the Vatican. But also they've got uh, the Catholic Church ties to the Portuguese because that's a Catholic country also. Now, Spain has been a, an object of a smear campaign by the new Protestants and the Protestant Reformation. They're using that new tool, which is sort of discounted by the church, the printing press, Gutenberg, new ideas spreading. See how those things all tie together. Okay, now the Portuguese, excuse me, the Spanish here uh, in the colonies taking over uh, in uh, Mexico, we have Juan uh, Hernan Cortez, excuse me, uh, Hernan Cortez uh, conquers the Aztecs, but he wasn't following orders. 
oh wait, here's a story. Okay, he is sent by the governor of Cuba, not the king of Spain, the governor of Cuba. Okay, uh, to go over there and look at this kingdom and see if there's actually gold and silver there and report back. He's told specifically, do not attack. Find information, come back. Cortez doesn't follow orders. He gets men together to actually go on a, a raiding party, uh, and that's going to cause problems. The governor of Cuba finds out about it uh, and uh, sends guys to capture Cortez. When they catch up with Cortez, Cortez says, hey, here's what we're going to do. Here's the plan. Are you in? And they say yes, and they join him. Okay. Now, the Spanish are seen by uh, the Aztecs as gods. There's a problem. Um, they had these... Uh, story that a god named Quetzalcoatl would come in from the uh, east riding a, a white bird and Quetzalcoatl had a beard. Aztecs didn't have beards. Well, look who has a beard here. And his ships coming in with their white sails were seen as this white bird. And so this must be the god Quetzalcoatl come to show the end here. Okay, uh, so this they're seen as gods, uh, but really the big thing that helps them defeat the Aztecs, besides superior technology, uh, because they're so outnumbered, is they ally themselves with the Aztec enemies, the former Aztec subjects, who are happy to decide with anybody who might get them out of being servants of the Aztecs. Okay, let's stop here. I can see it in your eyes, glazing over. I mean, it's been almost 10 minutes. Let's take a break here. We'll come back in a little bit with a part two of exploration for chapter 13 in Western Civilization.